Those guys are music majors down at uh, the college at BB, Arkansas State University, and uh, and I think they're teaching them something. It's like they're just getting better all the time, singing better. That sounds good, guys. You're harmonizing very well. I, I've taught them all I know. I'll just have to turn the rest of it over to those guys down there. <laughs> Open your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And while you're turning there, let me... Uh, let me just encourage you a little bit. I, th I think Wednesday night ought to be a time of encouragement. You know, we've been out in the world three days now since Sunday, and, uh, and, and things just happen. Does it ever get kind of just burdened a little bit or maybe tired a little bit or maybe just been bombarded by, uh, by different circumstances that come up? And you need to come on Wednesday night to get strengthened again and get your batteries recharged. Some things just happen, you know. I'll give you just... Before we get into the scriptures, I'll give you just a few things to, to ponder, just a few words of encouragement from, uh, from some, of those great, uh, some of those great philosophers like Yogi Berra. Here's one. Accept the fact that some days you're the pigeon, and some days you're the statue. Always keep your words soft and sweet just in case you have to eat them. Always read stuff that will make you look good in case you die right in the middle of it. Drive carefully. It's not only cars that can be recalled by their maker. If you can't be kind, at least have the decency to be vague. <laughs> if you lend someone $20 and they never repay it, it was probably worth it <laughs> not to have them around anymore. <laughs> it may be that your sole purpose in life is only to serve as a warning to others. Never buy a car you can't push. Never put both feet in your mouth at the same time because you won't have a leg to stand on. Since it's the early worm that gets the, the since it's the early worm that gets eaten by the bird, sleep late. I just made it up. <laughs> no, I, I I don't know. I, I don't know if I really have a source for this. It's gleaned. <laughs> it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. <laughs> when everything's coming your way you're probably in the wrong lane birthdays are good for you the more you have the longer you live and this one a truly happy person is one who can enjoy the scenery on a detour I like that one don't you uh, um my, I, I tell this story on my wife that uh, you know she loves to talk so well that one day she got a call and it was the wrong number and she talked for 30 minutes to him. <laughs> and that's, that is pretty close to being true. That happened one time. Well, it's the week of Valentine's and we're thinking about, thinking about the word love. That word is tossed around a lot and uh, some people are always trying to define it, usually wrongly. But I, uh, I guess it depends on who you ask on what kind of definition of love uh, you get. You know, what does love mean? I, I guess you've probably heard the little story about the salesman that stopped at the farmer's house and he was meeting the farmer and talking to him out in the yard. And, and uh, there's this pig walking around. And the pig got a peg leg on his left back and and his front right was a peg leg. And the, and the salesman said, man, what in the world happened to that pig? He said, oh, he said, it's a, it's a marvelous story. He said, a year ago, he said, uh, we were fattening that pig out to, to uh, make meat out of him. And one night, he said, our house caught on fire. And in the middle of the night, we were all asleep, and the smoke uh, put us deeper under, and we were unconscious. And he said, that pig... That little pig came in the house and dragged me out into the yard, dragged my wife out and both of our kids and saved our lives. He said, uh, that's a fine pig. Well, uh, 
farm, or the salesman said, well, that's, that's so sad. Uh, so he got both of his legs burned getting you out of the fire. He said, oh, no, he didn't get burned at all. He said, uh, we, uh, we took a ham and a front shoulder off of him and ate it. And the salesman said, you ate parts of the pig? He said, well, yeah. He said, when you love something like I love that pig, you can't just eat him all at once. So it depends on who's defining love and, uh, and how you look at it. And I, I've, uh, I've, I've come to the conclusion that some people just don't know uh, what love is. And I've been thinking about love this week. Seriously, I've been thinking about love and uh, been reading through the scriptures and thinking how the way love in our life, especially our love, for God and the love he has for us, how it affects the way we live and the joy we have and how we face the trials and tribulations and even death itself, the love of God. If we come to the end of our life before the Lord comes at the rapture, how will we face it? And will we regret how we've lived our life? And uh, if we should get news ahead of time that there's not much time left in our life, maybe because of some disease or something, how would we, how would we view that? And I, and I think I have some answers from the scripture that will help you tonight to be able to face life. And it won't take a long time, but I, I want us to look in John chapter 14 and look at the very first verse. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there, ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know. And the way, ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you'd bless us tonight. Help us to see from the scriptures how love can impact our lives, the way we live it and the way we face the end of it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, love can do a lot of things for us. I, I believe you just live a happier life. Now, this is just... With, I'm kind of giving you a general statement here before I've got some points and a little bit of an outline I really do but uh, love in general can just take your life and when you let it work and you meditate upon the love of God and how much he loves you it can relieve a lot of the stress out of your life because there's psychologists say for what it's worth that the one great need every one of us has is to love and to be loved to love and to be loved and that's greater friend there's people who have risked their lives for love there are people who have who have uh, sold out their fortune for love there are people who have gone to great lengths and done a lot of work and uh, put their whole life on the line for love's sake and if it's that powerful there must be something to it and uh, when somebody doesn't have a proper view of love, there's a lot of stress that can come into their life. I heard about the guy that walked into a classroom, his college classroom. He walked in and he held a glass of water up and he, and he asked uh, a question. Now all the students were thinking, uh, they're thinking he's going to ask what? What do you think he's going to ask? Is it half empty or is it half full? That's, that's the question everybody thought he was going to ask. But he didn't ask it, Miss Dell. He didn't ask that. You know what he said? He said, how much do you think this glass of water weighs? And everybody was kind of stunned. And finally somebody said, I, I, I guess 8 ounces. And somebody said 10. Somebody said 12. And they guessed all the way up to 20 ounces. And finally he said, it really, the absolute weight of that glass does not really matter for the illustration I want to give you. He said, what matters is how long I hold that glass of water. If I hold it for five minutes, I'm not really affected too much. If I hold that glass of water in the same position for an hour, my arm is going to be aching. If I hold that thing up for 
three hours, you're probably going to have to call an ambulance to get me. The longer you hold it, the heavier it gets. And here's, here's what happens in our life. Stress comes on us, and without love, we have no release. And the sooner we are able to set down that glass of water, set down the stress, and let love take over, the sooner we are relieved. Now, we may have to pick it up again tomorrow. But if you know that you're loved, you can carry that glass of water. Let me show you some things from this passage. And, uh, and just remember, whatever happens, if you're a child of God, you are not forgotten by God, and you are still loved. Now, let me show you just a few things. You can jot them down if it means anything to you. The first thing I want you to notice in, in John chapter 14 is, first of all, God's love is shown to us. And we're talking about recognizing God's love. There's people who cannot fathom the love of God. But God's love is shown to us by his provision of salvation. Look in John 14 one, once again. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe, underline the word believe, in God believe, there it is again, also in me. The word believe is important because that's how we get saved, by believing. Now, assuming that everybody in this room is saved tonight. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. I, I figure probably everybody in here is saved tonight. It would be, would be my guess. Well, you know how you got saved, right? You believed on what Jesus did on the cross. Now, do you think that God's love is insignificant if he had his son to go to the cross for you? Do you think his love has diminished any since you've been saved? The day I got saved, I experienced the wonderful love of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and taking that burden of sins off of me and taking away the guilt and the, and the penalty of those sins. But you know what happens over a course of time, we tend to forget about those things a little bit and it's not as exciting, it's not as, as great, it's not as tremendous, it's not as awesome as it was the day that we were forgiven and we tend to downplay the love of God. I mean, how much love did he have? Go to John chapter 3 and verse 16. Look at two verses there with me. John three sixteen, probably the most memorized verse in the whole Bible. And yet it, because it is such a popular and well-known verse, we even sometimes forget about the importance of what is said in John 3, 16. Look at it with me. For God so, next word, love the world. Now, it's not, talking about he didn't, it's not talking about he loved the rocks and the hills and the rivers and the lakes. Now, he created all that and he said it's good, but what he's talking about here is God so loved the world. He's talking about the people in the world, right? And God so loved the world. He loved the people of the world, everybody in it, no matter who they are, when they lived, and what age they lived in, no matter whether they would have been considered a good citizen or the sorriest rascal in town. God loved them. Now, friend, that's something that can cheer your spirits up. That's something that can re relieve the stress. Can you understand and remember the wonderful thought that God loved you and saved you. Now look at verse 17. Well, let's read the rest of verse 16 first. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Boy, there's the price. That he gave his only begotten son. I was reading just a day or two ago about when Abraham uh, was called to sacrifice his own son, Isaac, on Mount Moriah. And uh, Abraham had been looking forward to having this son for a long time. He didn't have that son until he was an old man. And now he's told to take that son. Take Isaac. Go sacrifice him. Can you imagine the pain that must have struck his heart? Thinking now he's got to sacrifice that son that he loved so much. Well, just think about God the Father's heart. And his son was not a sinner. His son was perfect. His son never did anything wrong. Yet God was willing to lay down his son's life for you and me. That's pretty special, friend. And so one of those days when you feel like the statue instead of the pigeon, you just remember that you've got a God that loves you. Look at verse 17. Well, I still hadn't got through 16 yet, have I? His only begotten son, that was the price, that whosoever believeth in him, that means everybody, should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. There's no other single 
thing that God could do that would show his love more greatly than the fact that he sent his son to die on the cross for you and me. What a love. What a love. We hear it so often that it just kind of bounces off, friend. But look, if you have problem feeling accepted, if you have problem feeling like you're worth anything, you remember that God gave his son for you. And even those who are not saved tonight could be saved if they wanted to be. What a love. In fact, John 15, 13 says, Greater love hath no man this than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Romans, Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a love. Now let, let me tell you a second thing. A second thing. Now, I'm, I'm talking about how to view the love of God so that we can have a less stressful, a more rewarding, abundantly full life, a joyful life because of God's love. Now look at this, second thing. God shows his love to his submissive children in a special way. Now go back to John 14 again <coughs> and verse number 15. Watch this. I love studying the scriptures. I like seeing how they fit together. And uh, look at this, John chapter 14 Verse 15, John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my what? Well, so God says, if, if you love me, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if we have the love of God in us, that ought to be the thing that we do. Now skip on down to verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Now who loves God according to that verse? the ones who keep his commandments, right? Now let's read on. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. Oh, you were, you were loved already even as a lost sinner. He loved you enough to send his son to die on the cross and then once you accepted him, now he says God's even going to show you more love in a special way and that's when you keep his commandments, when you're a submissive child. So here's the thing. People get saved and oftentimes they've, they walk away thinking that, okay, it's over. I've got saved. Now I can go back and live my life and do as I please and, uh, and everything's okay. No, there's, there's probably going to be an emptiness. There's probably going to be a, uh, a stress. There's going to be unfulfilled joy. Why? Because the scripture plainly says that if we love him, we'll obey him. And if we obey him, then the Father loves us in another special way. So we're getting more love than we even had before. Isn't that what it says? So if we obey him, we have more love. You say, well, now preacher, I've heard it said that when you've got God's love, his love is perfect and you've got it all, you can't get any more. Is that true? Let me ask you this. As far as we're concerned, we can experience... Uh, let, me, let, me, let me start over. You can be loved by somebody and not feel loved. Am I making sense? You can be loved and not feel loved. So from a practical standpoint, if you don't feel loved then as far as you're concerned, you might as well not even be loved because you're not enjoying it. Now, let me take you to uh, Hebrews chapter number 12. And I want, to show you, I want to show you where I'm going here. This ought to affect every Christian's life. This is a powerful, powerful statement where God shows us his love in a special way. And if we don't submit and live according to his will for our life, we will not experience in our own heart the feeling of that love that, that he has for us. Now we're in, we're in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 6. Uh, let me ask you a question. Were you like me and growing up, maybe as a smaller child, if you had, uh, if you had parents in the home who corrected you from time to time. Anybody ever, anybody ever get paddling? 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody, Mrs. Crockett, she's goody two shoes. She never got one. <laughs> she ain't fooling me for a minute. <laughs> you've you've had your you've had your bottom warmed with a switch or a paddle, or if you didn't get that, there's probably been times when your parents corrected you, scolded you, spoke sharply to you. They made you avoid getting to do something that was fun, but somehow they administered some discipline, right? And uh, at that moment when they're disciplining you, is your heart just overflowing with the feeling of their love? <laughs> now they love you still, but do you feel all that? I mean, you're, you're bent over and, uh, and, and, and maybe mom's got that peach tree limb and boy, she's getting whack, whack. And you're just bent over saying, boy, I feel so loved right now. <laughs> Not me. I feel like that's the meanest woman in the world. What's she doing to me? She's beating me. <laughs> Maybe dad took a belt. or, a, or a, My grandpa used a, what he called a razor strop. Back in those days, he still had an old straight razor. And, uh, and razor, razor, it was a razor strap, I guess. But he called it a razor strop. And... Uh, and that thing was a piece of leather about, about that wide. It's like a big old belt. It's like a paddle made out of leather is what it's like. And, uh, and that's what he used to sharpen that razor on it, razor strap. And, uh, and when he got after us kids, when we were down at Grandpa's house, if he told us to quit doing something, we didn't quit it, he got the razor strap. <laughs> and you talk about uh, warming you up on the backside, it'd warm you up. If he didn't have the razor strop handy, we were riding the we were riding our tricycles. I don't know. We was probably five, six, seven years old, and uh, the old front porch there where Grandpa had sat in his rocking chair. Uh, he's sitting there trying to doze off, take a nap about middle of the afternoon, and and two or three of us grandkids were we had tricycles and we were running them back and forth across those old boards on the front porch, right in front of his feet. We'd ride those things fast. We'd go and those old boards on the porch were loose and they'd go flop, 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 and they'd rattle when we'd run across there. We did that four or five times and. Finally, he said, all right, that's enough of that. He said, quit it. Well, we ran back across there again and just made those old boards rattle, 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 rattle one more time. He said, if you do that one more time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear you out. Well, my brother's a little older than me. He's always led me into sin. Wasn't my fault. I was good. He's just leading me astray. And so my brother, Sonny, winked at me and said, let's do it again. <laughs> so he took off across there. Man, he's going fast and and just as he went by, I'm right behind him, you know, following him into sin. And just as I got up there even with him, Grandpa reached out and snagged me by the arm. He pulled me off that tricycle. He didn't have his razor stop there. There was an old inner tube out of a tire laying there. He picked that inner tube up, and man, he wore me out with that inner tube. Now, I didn't feel very loved at that moment. I felt like he was the meanest old fellow in the whole wide world. You know what, now, his love didn't change. If my mama, my dad, or anybody else that was authority over me if they spanked me their love didn't change but I felt like it did and uh, anybody that's nutty enough to think that a whooping feels good is really off their rocker now Hebrews with that in mind I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 12 verse number 6 for whom the Lord next word loveth now we've established that he loves us isn't that true for God so loved the world he loved us enough to give his only begotten son. Okay, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Now what's chastening? That's a razor strop. That's an inner tube. That's a paddle. That's a switch. That's a belt. It's correction. It's discipline. And it doesn't feel good. Are you with me? So what does the Bible say? The one the Lord loves, he chastens, he spanks, he disciplines. Why does he do that? Because he hates them? No, because he loves them. Now watch this. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now wait a minute. Who's the ones that he's received? That's the saved, right? God doesn't spank the devil's children. He spanks his own children. And so if you see somebody who... who claims to be a Christian and their life doesn't look like it ever changed one smidgen and they can go and do everything under the sun that a lost person does and they just keep on doing it endlessly 
And according to the scripture, the reason they ain't getting a whipping, if they ain't getting a whipping from God, it's because it's not one of God's kids. <laughs> Hello? I mean, if it's the devil, why would God spank the devil's kids? Theirs is coming. And it's going to be worse. It's eternal fire. And so God's not worried about spanking them. He's spanking his own kids. And so when you're born into the family of God, you can expect to be chastened by a loving father. And by the way, stop there just for a second. Those who accuse us Baptists of saying, well, you just get saved and go live any way you want to and you still go to heaven. Well, if you're saved, you're going to heaven. But you're not going to live any way you want to and get by with it. It's just that God has a way of dealing with us. It's not sending us to hell. When we're saved, we misbehave. God doesn't say, all right, I'm going to throw you into hell. No, he said, I'm going to wear your britches out. So when, when God has uh, warned us through the Holy Spirit of God, through the Word of God, maybe through preaching or teaching or maybe our own Bible reading, God warns us and we keep on doing it, we're not going to get by with it. Why? Because of this passage right here. He says that he's going to chasten us. Now, verse 7, he says, if, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. Okay, there's the proof. It's the children of God that get the chastening, not the devil's children. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Okay, here's the question. If somebody's not getting chastening, he says in verse 8, but if you be without chastisement, whereof all, all who? All of God's children. All are partakers. Then are you bastards and not sons. Now that, that's not a cuss word. That's a word that means an illegitimate child. It means it doesn't belong to God. That child doesn't belong to God. And so if somebody doesn't experience the chastening of God, they're not loved in the same way. But now here's, here's the point I'm getting to. Let's read on. Verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. That's what I'm talking about. And we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now look at verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be what? It's not joyous, but what? Grievous. So here's the point. When a child of God is not living for the Lord, is rebelling against God, he says, I don't care what the preacher says. If I want to drink booze, I'll drink booze. The, the, the rebellious one says, I don't care what Christians say. If I want to sleep around and, and do my own thing and sow my wild, wild oats, I'll do it. It's my business. The only thing you've got to keep in mind is when you do your own thing against God's will, God loves you enough that he's going to spank your britches. But here's the bottom line where I'm getting to. When he's spanking you, you won't feel very loved. <laughs> because it says right here that no chastening is joyous, but what is it? Grievous. That means <laughs> you want to cry about it. And so you won't, you won't be experiencing the joy of the love of God when you're out of the will of God. And so we're talking about how... The love of God affects our lives from the time we're born again till the day we die. And nobody can live as they please and thumb their nose at God and say, I'll do as I please, and you're not going to tell me what to do. Then they're not going to get the enjoyment out of that love that God has for them. God still loves them. But they're not going to feel like it. And, and that's sad. Because Jesus came that we might have life and we might have it more abundantly. That's what he wants. Well, so accepting God's correction brings peaceful recognition of his love once again, and then we're back on track. Probably all of us have experienced the chastening hand of God. If you've been saved for more than just a, a few hours or a few days, <laughs> you've probably experienced the chastening hand of God. But as soon as you agree with God and you say, Lord, you're right, I deserve that. And I recognize that it's because of your love that you're doing this for me to get me back on track. And I repent, ask you forgiveness. And when we, when we do that, we're headed down the right road. Then we can receive the blessings of his love again. He still loves us either way. 
It just doesn't feel like it. I don't know about you, but I'd rather feel loved than not loved. Right? Say, hello? Okay. <laughs> Number three, God shows love during times of grief. We're talking about the love of God through life. Enjoying an abundant life. Now look at John 14, uh, back at verse number one again. Let not your heart be what? Troubled. You ever have a troubled heart? Oh, yeah. God's children get troubled hearts. We get troubled about sickness. We get troubled about wayward children. We get troubled about finances. We get troubled about jobs. We get troubled about aches and pains. We get troubled about a lot of stuff. But he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now also look at verse number 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another what? Comforter. That he, that he may abide with you. That word abide means take up. Listen, abide means to take up permanent dwelling, permanent residence. And here Jesus has not been crucified yet, but he's saying, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Once I'm crucified and risen and I go back to the Father, I'm sending the Holy Spirit that the church will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Every believer from that, from that time on when they get saved will receive the indwelling, the permanent residence for the Spirit of God. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, Paul said, what? Know ye not you are, that you are the temple of God? He said, you're God's temple. And we're the house where the Holy Spirit lives. And so during times of grief, we have somebody closer than a brother. Maybe you had to bury a loved one. And boy, that's about as deep a grief as you can experience, isn't it? That's deep grief. I mean, just sometimes you just cry and you feel like you can't even cry anymore just don't have anything left in there to cry out and you still hadn't got relief about it. You know, they say a lot of times it's just good to have a good cry and I think it is at times, but boy, sometimes the grief can go so deep you've cried all you can cry and you're still hurting and you can't even cry anymore. And when somebody comes and puts an arm around your shoulder and just kind of hugs you, they may not even say anything. They just hug you and you know what it means. They love you. In fact, you know, most of the time when somebody's going through deep grief, less is more. Sometimes we try to preach somebody a sermon when they've lost a loved one, and we go and tell them, oh, don't cry, it's, it'll be okay. You know, their world's falling apart. Don't tell them not to cry. It's okay to cry. Or we say, well, you know, I know you lost your husband or lost your wife, and lost your child, but they're in a better place now. Oh, Listen, somebody's going through a lot of deep grief. They probably won't show it, but sometimes that makes them feel like just slugging somebody. It's like saying, well, you shouldn't grieve, nothing to grieve about. Well, yeah, there's something to grieve about. It's deep grief. And when they just put an arm around you and just say, I love you, that's usually enough. We don't have to preach anybody a sermon. We don't have to say, I know just how you feel. You know, I was went to the hospital in the last year or so and, and visiting somebody that, that just had a baby and, and somebody I could joke with and uh, after they had the baby I went to visit them I said I, look I know just how you feel <laughs> and then I laughed and she laughed and she knew I, I didn't have a clue how she felt and she knew it and you know that's thank God men don't have to have babies <laughs> you know I've heard this it's the worst pain you can have without dying and uh, but you know that's kind of, you know, when we say something uh, to somebody that's going through a great deal of grief, you know, sometimes it just kind of hurts more if we try to, try to tell them that they don't have any reason to be grieving when they really do. So the best thing to do is just let them know you love them. Just let them know that you're praying for them. But what I'm really getting at here is that the Holy Spirit dwells inside the, the believer. And while it's great to have somebody who loves you to come and put an arm around your shoulder, tell you that they love you, when you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit of God living within you. He doesn't even have to put an arm around your shoulder. He's in you. And the Bible says that he can make your, 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 your prayers when you're not even able to pray with intelligent 
words that he can take your groanings and make them known to God and he can go to the throne of grace for you and the Holy Spirit can do more for you than anybody else and it's great that we can comfort one another and love one another but the Holy Spirit of God is your greatest comforter of all. Well, let me, let me hurry. I've got, I'm trying to get done by 8 o'clock here. I, I can do it too. <laughs> Just remember, God shows his love when? During times of grief and suffering and loss. And uh, I know Sarah and Jimmy have told me uh, in the last week or two that they have come closer to God going through what they're going through right now with her having that brain tumor. They, they're closer to God than ever before and that God's blessing them in a great way and they're, they're enjoying life. God comes to you through the Holy Spirit in times of deep grief and suffering and loss. Number four, God shows his love through the brethren to each other. John 13, 34. Skip over one chapter. 13, 34. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurry here, but grasp this one. A new commandment. Jesus is speaking. He said, A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. Somebody... Uh, some guy came by a church and was asking for some help, said he was a preacher uh, that had uh, broken down on the road and needed some help. And the, and the pastor said, well, uh, if you're a preacher, then, uh, then prove it to me. He said, uh, how, many, how many commandments are there? He said, 11. And the preacher, uh, the pastor said, well, <laughs> yeah, he said, if you, <laughs> you, show, you tell me what the 11th commandment is and I'll help you. And the preacher said, the 11th one is in John. Chapter 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you. Remember, there's 10 over in Exodus chapter 20. And here Jesus gives a new commandment. That guy knew what he was talking about. 11 commandments. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. I think we have a pretty loving church. I, I do. I, I've always thought that, and uh, we've got some great people. Probably got is probably got the the most loving bunch of people together right now as we've ever had in our church, and uh, and this is what Jesus said was a sign to those around us. Look at this, verse thirty-five. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If circle that word if if ye have love one to another. You know the best advertisement we can have for Jesus Christ? The best advertisement we can have for this church? The best advertisement we can have for our church is when we love one another and other people can see it. They know something's different. Number five, and I'll be done. God shows us comfort at death. Now look once again at John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Verse two, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Why? Because this place where we live, ladies and gentlemen, as you already know, is a temporary place. We live in a temporary body. The Bible calls it a tabernacle. Paul called it a tabernacle. He said, he said if this tab when this tabernacle is dissolved, and it will be, it will go to the grave and be dissolved, but yet we will be in heaven with him. And at the rapture, this body will be raised up incorruptible once again. But we live temporarily in this body now. We live temporarily in this world. We're just pilgrims who are passing through. And there is an end to this journey. Now, the Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die. It is appointed unto men once to die. You and I are going to die. The only, escape, the only escape from that is that the Lord Jesus comes back at the rapture first. And then, and I'm kind of hoping that happens, I'd rather go by way of the upper taker than the undertaker. But if not, <laughs> kind of like what uh, the three Hebrew children said to the king when uh, he was going to cast them into the fiery furnace if they didn't bow down and worship his image. They said, we believe God's going to deliver us. But if not, we're still not bound down to your, king, your image, King. If not, I'd like to go up in the rapture, but if not, if I'm not delivered from the grave by the rapture, then here's what's going to make that time bearable. 
and maybe even enjoyable. When we come to the end of this life, there's one thing, there's one thing, friend, that's going to make our end of our life, that deathbed experience, only one thing is going to make it worth going through. Now, we're already talking about people that are saved, right? So we know we're going to heaven. But how many are going to run out of here and go jump in front of a semi-truck and go tonight? No, I didn't think so. Uh, we want to live as long as God leaves us here, right? We want to live our life out. We're, t we're said to, to number our days, and, and we have a, a death day just like we have a birthday. We just don't know when that death day is, and we're coming to it. But what's going to keep it from being a grievous time? What if the doctor said, you have a tumor, and, uh, and maybe you've got three months, six at the most, to live? Would you be bitter? Would you say, it's not fair? I should get to live longer. Or, would you know God close enough? Listen, here, here's, here, we're coming right down to the very end of this thing. Would you know God's love well enough that laying on your deathbed, you could say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Could you say, yea, though he leadeth me through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I won't fear the undertaker. How can we do that? I think it's only going to come by knowing God so well that we know he loves us and that the moment that our soul departs this body that he's going to be taking us up in his blessed arms and holding us personally. I think knowing the love of God, friend, listen, this, this is what I, I meant to get to during the whole sermon is knowing God's love strong enough that when the end of this life comes, we'll say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Why? Because he loves me. If I don't know that he loves me, I'll be fearful when that time comes. But if I know that he loved me enough to send his son to die for me, if I know that he loves me enough to give me abundant joy, if I know that he loves me enough to give me a comforter, if I know he loves me enough to chasten me when I need it, if I know he loves me like a father and I'm fully aware of that love at the end of this life, then I will be able to smile and say I'm looking forward to seeing my heavenly father rather than being fearful. That's where we're headed. And Let's learn about the love of God. Hey, it's not just the Methodists and the Pentecostals and the, and the Presbyterians that know something about the love of God. Baptists ought to know something about the love of God. And uh, we ought to be doctrinally correct about the love of God. It's real, and it'll get us through. Not only through this life, it'll help us to cross the river when we get to the end of it. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer? Father, thank you for your love. And Lord, we don't say that lightly. We know that you love us. We've only seen a few glimpses in these passages of Scripture that shows your love tonight. But we know your love is so grand that if we meditate upon it, if we study it, if we embrace it and never forget it, Lord, we'll not only be able to enjoy this life loving and being loved, but we'll know that when we come to the end of it, we're still loved. I pray that you'd just put your arms around us tonight. And bless our hearts with the sense of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you stand, please, as the music plays? If you need to talk to the Lord, there's an altar here. I invite you to come and just kneel at this altar and just say, Dear Lord, I'm glad you love me. How great thou art. What a love he has for us. Oh, it's a study. It's a study that can take the form of months and months of devotions and never cover the same ground twice. Just seeing what the scriptures say about his love. What a wonderful love. If you love him, you won't love the world. If you love him, you won't love the things of the world. If you love him, you won't love sin. So you can't raise a garden and love your garden without hating the weeds. 
And that's the way it is with God. If you love God, you'll hate the sin that tries to creep into your life. Thank you for being here tonight. I, I, I would challenge you. 